so much, Jake. <clears throat> and thank you, Michael, for being here with us tonight. Michael Thank is you. the, <clears throat> you're welcome. <laughs> Michael is the founder of Acadia Birding Festival, Maine's first birding festival, and the president of Down East Bird Watching and Nature Tours, whose mission is to safeguard the e ecological integrity of the Gulf of Maine bioregion through holistic experiential programs in ornithology and ecology aimed at educating the public about our unique global ornithological connections and the impacts of human ecology in the Gulf of the Maine bioregion. And we're really excited to have him here tonight to share his photography and um, the, the, the documentation that he's done so far. Um, so Michael, thank you so much. We're really looking forward to it. Well, thank you very much. Um, as I said earlier, I've never really done a webinar before, so um, I'm glad I have two faces to look at and it makes me feel like I have a crowd out in front of me. So uh, thank you very much. Um, well, um, this the inspiration for this talk came a couple of years ago when I was asked to do a talk at um, Wings, Waves and wa uh, Woods. And um, so I started thinking about things that had happened in the past. And um, one of the, let me see, I gotta figure out how to change the, move forward here. Hold on. So, so Mike, if you want to go to your um, presentation, you can go to view on the top in the orange, or you can go to slideshow over to the right a little bit from where your cursor is up, up just a bit into the orange. Yeah, I got to put this down here. Sorry. There, there we, we go. go. Startup slideshow from the beginning. From the beginning. There we are. Okay, great. And then I should just be able to click through. So, um, so the inspiration for this really came from our friend um, Tim, Tim Cupras in Australia back in 1997. My wife and I uh, had done a trip and all the trips that we had been doing when I first started my business was uh, focused on birds. And um, once we got down to Australia, people were kind of amazed that I already knew to all the Australian birds. But my friend Tim um, was trying to figure out how to photograph birds. And I kept saying to him, come on, Tim, you gotta, you gotta shoot, you gotta shoot. It's, a, it's only a brief moment in time. And we started using that term. And then before I knew it, it became a new acronym. And now the whole world's using it, not really. But um, uh, a BIMIT, um, these brief moments in, in time are really the 10th the of a second that you have with maybe a rare species or something that you wanna get, uh, some kind of a bird that you wanna uh, photograph, but you only have a brief moment because birds don't sit still. They don't really la uh, sit there and wait for you to take their picture. So that's the documentation side. You wanna learn how to use your camera so that you can capture those very quick moments. You may only have a brief second with a bird and it'll be gone. And then you're sitting around trying to remember what it looked like and what the, the um, plumage looked like and what kind of bird was it was. So, um, so this is really a way um, to capture these brief moments, maybe capture the character of the, of the bird you're looking at and um, uh, be able to uh, give that information uh, to the world um, nowadays through digital imagery. So um, that's where the, the term uh, brief moment in time came from in my life. Um, and it really takes uh, quite a bit of dedication to photography, I think. Um, you have to worry about the details and we'll get into uh, some of that. I don't wanna make this too much a scientific, you know, focus on photography. I want it to be more of a fun experience, but um, my friend Nil, uh, Nils Navarro down in Cuba, we uh, started talking about the F8 rule where you wanna make sure speed and aperture in your ISO is equal to at least uh, the F8 or aperture size eight. Um, so that in that brief moment, when you do have a chance to shoot a bird, you're prepared and you're ready to shoot at an F stop that will give you a, a, a great deal of, of you know, a depth of field and um, give you some of that and really important information that, that we want to put out there uh, for science, uh, the science of ornithology. Um, and uh, so we, uh, you can also shoot in sports mo mode. Um, if you 
have that kind of a camera and uh, you set it on sports mode and that sports mode is set to um, uh, uh, capture some of the fast movements in a sporting event. And that's what birds are. Birds are moving all the time. So, um, so you wanna remember that the aperture on your lens um, dic dictates the depth of field. So uh, the larger the aperture, the more depth of field and the more uh, of the bird that's going to be in focus. So if you have a choice of shooting at uh, F6 versus F22, and you have enough light, you wanna make sure you're shooting at those high um, F stops. Um, so uh, yeah, and along with composition, um, the depth of field is, is really uh, the way to uh, um, focus your attention on what you want people to, to, to key in on a particular bird. Um, these are a couple of shots from Australia. Um, I did not have a digital camera in 1997. We didn't have the internet either. And so uh, those were different days. And um, you would shoot a picture and you would wait two or three weeks and you might have gotten the bird and you might not have. And uh, those were um, interesting times and I, uh, I've actually seen both of these birds in Australia, the Lori Keed and the fairy wren. And um, here you can see in this picture with the fairy wren, you can see the focus is on the head and the tail is slightly out of focus. So there's a good chance that maybe um, there wasn't enough light and uh, he wasn't able to uh, get that whole bird into focus or maybe he chose to do it that way. So um, those are the kind of things that we wanna focus on when we're uh, thinking about photography. Um, here's uh, another example here. The f-stop is, is uh, high enough that the bird is uh, totally in focus. And you can see this is an immature uh, uh, hermit thrush. And over here with the black-throated green uh, warbler, this is a female. Um, you can see I focused more on her, on her head and wanted to make sure that that was in focus. So, um, those are the places of information that people are gonna be looking for uh, when you're trying to document birds for eBird, for example. Um, so what is a camera? Um, a camera is a device for recording images that um, uh, of an object that are light sensitive uh, surfaces. And the camera is essentially a, a, a light tight box with uh, aperture and a way to focus that light onto a sensitive uh, film or a plate. Um, the camera takes all those rays of light that are around you and focuses them down onto the, um, the camera sensor. And that creates hopefully a sharp image. And um, you know, then you will be all excited about the picture that you got and you can put it on eBird and everybody will see it. Um, so eyes, our eyes are very similar to how a camera works and the iris controls light the very same way that an aperture on a camera does um, by opening and closing. And it's uh, a quite a similar um, uh, type of thing. In fact, we talk about eyes that are camera-like and human eyes are, are that way. So when we get too much light, the, the aperture of our eyes closes down and that's the same thing that you wanna do with, with a camera. Um, light rays, you know, you got a whole variety of light waves um, from gamma waves to radio waves. And we really, and birds also, are really seeing in that visible range. Some birds can see down into ultraviolet, like some of the hummingbirds, but it's really in this visible light range that our cameras are um, collecting that light. Of course, this is a simple DSL uh, R um, camera. Light comes in, it gets focused on the sense uh, sensor, and there's a way of um, uh, uh, bouncing that light off of, of mirrors so that you actually see that in the eyepiece. So you're seeing what the sensor is seeing. So if you're seeing something out of focus, your sensor is probably gonna see it out of focus too. So something to remember. Um, and again, the elements inside a camera, you're, you want to try to get um, the best quality lenses um, that you can afford. And that is usually people's 
a limiting factor is how much money they can spend on their lenses and on their um, camera. But uh, I'm shooting with a Nikon 7100 and my um, camera lens is the Tamron 150 to 600. Um, I would like to buy a Nikon and somewhere down the road that might happen now that my kids are in college. But um, it's, uh, it's an important part of the whole photography side that you try to get the best, uh, uh, best camera and best lens that you can afford. Um, so um, all of this goes back for me, I'll do a little um, marketing here. Um, Down East Nature Tours kind of grew out of the fact that when I came back from Europe in 92, I realized that, wait, nobody's talking about ecology. And um, I had been studying birds uh, for ever since I was really a young boy. And I just thought that, okay, I've got to find a way to, to make this happen so that we can educate the public. And um, photography came a big part of that because you want people to see what you're seeing. And uh, the whole documentation side of this is an important, uh, plays an important role in science uh, and the science that we do. Um, Acadia Birding Festival came into play around 1997. And in order to get people excited about birds, we really wanted to photograph and get a lot of uh, photography going. And so we just kind of started to hone uh, those skills and move in that direction so people uh, can uh, see what we're seeing as ornithologists. Um, I used the James Bond mobile. Any of you that knows James Bond was an ornithologist, and but he's also one of our spies that we all know. And uh, James Bond has a connection here on Mount Desert Island. Uh, my friend Jim Wright just recently wrote a book about James Bond, the ornithologist, the real James Bond. So uh, I've been driving around the James Bond mobile for uh, quite a while and have a lot of fun uh, with that whole part of the, the biology and all the things that James Bond did for us, both in Cuba where I work and also uh, here at home. So uh, it's a very interesting connection with James Bond, the ornithologist. Um, I am. Uh, putting out books now. And this is uh, my newest attempt uh, at gathering together all of my 2020 photos. Um, every year is a big year, Mount Desert Island Birds and Other Social Commentary. And that book is available now. And um, it's been a lot of fun to see how photography plays a role in these uh, web pages and things like that. So, um, uh, the other thing uh, you can see here that um, over the years now, I've gathered about 394 species with photos. And um, uh, that's been a big part of my own um, pushing myself to, to get as many species as I can photograph before I cross over. And uh, I'm really trying to do that very hard here in uh, Hancock County too. So you can see I've uh, photograph 254 species. And um, it gives me a lot of joy to put a lot of this stuff out there. I just recently found two new life birds for Hancock County, um, Acadia, or sorry, American oyster catcher I just got uh, yesterday um, on the bar. Uh, that was uh, first for me in Hancock County. And hooded warbler, which is another one of these southern species that uh, you know, that we're starting to see here in Maine. And here they are here. So in order to show those correctly, um, the oyster catcher shot was shot from far away. So when you're shooting from a, a distance, you have to really make sure you've got your center focus right on that bird. And I was probably, well, I was on the whale watch boat and we were probably about at least uh, 400 feet away from these birds. So, but the most important thing is that you gather the information about that bird in your photography. So these long day glow bills, um, the orange eye rings and the, the uh, brown and white body are important information for people to say, yep, he definitely got an oyster catcher and uh, it was definitely, you know, there. So. Um, that's why I feel like it, uh, in this modern world that we're living in, photography plays a really important role, um, especially with our eBird 
and uh, you know other forms of science uh, data collection. Um, so this is a big part of, of ornithology now is gathering these images and making sure that people uh, get a chance to see what you were looking at. Um, the hooded warbler was a bird that I've seen quite a bit in um, Cuba, but I've never gotten one here in Maine. So I was very excited about, about that and thankful for other people who were able to find it. Um, I've used my photography now um, over the last several years. Uh, we just made a, a, this uh, tour guide. It's a guide for the west side of Mount Desert Island. And this is a way to use your pho photography um, to, um, uh, in this case, we made a, a trail that people could go and we had uh, 60 plus pictures of birds that I've taken on the island. And uh, we added that to the sounds uh, using the Macaulay Library um, for uh, the sounds. And we produced this um, tour guide for people who are coming from away. So just examples of how you can use photography and its uh, importance. Um, another place that I've worked quite a bit, and it's a place that has a lot of sunshine, a lot of light, um, and that's down in Cuba, the Caribbean Conservation Trust. Um, we are trying once again to um, start up our tours after this COVID experience. And um, one of the things I love doing in Cuba is photographing birds. As you can see here, this is a prothonotary warbler in a yucca flower. So if you have an opportunity to use some of the vegetation and those things to put the bird into context, that's a really important part of uh, ornithology and uh, the uh, photography that we're doing because it gives people an idea of, of what the bird is, is uh, using um, for their food sources or uh, nesting and those kind of things. Um, the smallest bird in the world is on the left hand uh, and the right hand side, sorry. This is a female over here on the right and this is the male. But you can see the kind of fine detail that we wanna try to capture um, we talk a lot about iridescent feathers, these feathers that are like oil sheens. And uh, when the light penetrates them, uh, they bounce back, uh, uh, reflect other light. And this is a good example of uh, the feathers when they're turned in just the right direction. And you want to learn to uh, hone your skills so you can capture some of those, uh, um, some of those moments with these birds. Um, yeah, this is the bee hummingbird down in Cuba, and it's just really a, a special creature to uh, have spent a lot of time with. Um, here's a bee hummingbird foraging on, a, on a, uh, a flower, and you can see if you've got your ISO set uh, correctly and um, your aperture is, is the right uh, size, you can really get detail when these birds are in flight as well. If I had a little faster ISO, a little faster shutter speed, I could capture uh, the single wing beats of a hummingbird that's beating around 300 beats per minute. So it's a very hard bird to kind of capture by uh, using um, SLR. But uh, if you have uh, the ISO settings and all those things correct, it is possible to stop some of these very fast motions in birds. Um, so uh, birds have the ability to move. That really complicates and creates what I refer to as the bimet, the brief moment in time. So uh, you wanna be as quiet as you can. You wanna move slowly. Never try to point at a bird with your hand or your fingers because that acts like a shotgun and boom, the bird is out of there. And you may miss your moment for that rare species that you thought you had, but it's now gone. And Nobody will believe you. <laughs> um, there's, uh, uh, you wanna learn about bird habits and bird habitats and um, uh, try to better understand where they'll be, what time of the year they'll be there. And those are all important factors that will help you uh, get good photography. Um, try to get the sun behind you. That doesn't always work. So sometimes you have to deal with the lighting conditions that you have. You can change your aperture, you can change your shutter speed. 
Um, but the best thing to do is try to get the sun behind what are in front or yet behind you in, and on the creature that you're trying to shoot. Um, you want to learn the signs that a bird is getting ready to flee, that you've gotten too close. And I think you should practice um, trying not to get close to bird. Or you can get as close as you can, but you have to find out and learn, unfortunately, by the, the uh, Braille method on how to get closer to birds without disturbing them. And that's a key fact. We don't want to disturb the birds that we're trying to photograph. And I know a lot of photographers do a lot of weird things to get photos of birds. And you really don't have to do that. If you understand how the birds function and how they work, um, you'll be able to get good photography without, without um, using uh, you know, methods that are um, going to scare the bird away. Um, know uh, which sense the animal depends on uh, to warn of danger. If you're quiet as you can be, then uh, the animals will typically not fly away. There's only a few birds that can smell you and that's the turkey vulture. So um, the rest of the time, you don't really have to worry about where you are relative to wind. It's more about how you're moving and um, learning how to stay out of sight. Um, your car can work very well um, and it's a good way to not disturb a bird. But unfortunately, with a short-eared owl that we just had up at the airport, there were a great number of people who were staying in their car, but they were driving right up to the bird and uh, disturbing it. And those are the things I think we need to educate the public about, especially people who are getting into photography and trying to shoot birds. And they need to learn that it's not good to uh, get too close to some of these um, uh, creatures, especially the the ones like owls and birds that are, are rare, you want other people to be able to see them and sometimes you'll chase them away. So um, that, uh, that can be a, a problem. So patience, persistence, luck and determination. Those are the four uh, kind of factors that play into all of this photography. Um, so here's a good example of a bird that will, um, not be very nice to you if you get close to it. Um, the Northern goshawk is a specialty bird here in the region. I have a couple of places that I will take uh, only certain people and I take them because they have never seen a bird or that they, um, you know, uh, it's, it's gonna be a life bird for them. And this is a, a very interesting creature. Um, Northern goshawk will take your head off if you do the wrong thing. And um, uh, so you wanna make sure that you're being careful around these more sensitive birds because Northern goshawks are flying through very tiny windows through the forest. And what you don't wanna do is set the bird up for failure and for injury. And uh, so it's really important that you are careful around these more sensitive creatures um, that we have uh, here in Maine, especially. Um, here's another example. Now you can see on the right, all I captured in that one photo was the tail. But if you're trying to figure out what the bird is, that's probably enough to show this, you know, long occipiter tail. You've got these poofy feathers out here on the on the uh, upper um, uh, part of the, uh, the tail that stick out on the flanks. So any kind of information you can get, especially if it's a rare bird, um, and that, that's what we need to see to be able to know that that's exactly what you saw. Um, so uh, another shot here of Northern goshawk. These are amazing creatures. I, I have it on the, the copy of this book because I'm just, I'm fascinated by uh, these guys, um, and um, it's, it's uh, definitely a bird that gets people excited. So um, finding birds uh, for uh, photography and uh, documentation. Um, some days are harder than others. Some days I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I uh, often... Um, have days where nothing is clicking, nothing is working. I can't seem to get a, a photo for the life of me. Um, those days are 
somewhat in the past, but when you're first starting, you're going to have ups and downs and it's a learning curve. So just keep, uh, keep that whole idea of persistence and dedication. and You'll be able to uh, start capturing some really nice images. Um, locating the birds can be difficult. You've got cluttered habitat like you see in here. Um, and uh, one way that you can really help yourself with this, uh, um, with uh, birds is to learn their calls. Um, that will reduce the time that you're searching for a bird and the uh, times that um, it takes to search for a bird. And you wanna learn their uh, communication songs, um, call notes or low amplitude songs that uh, help you to realize that there's a particular species um, near you. Um, migrant traps, um, especially uh, things like uh, feeder complexes um, are places that you can uh, often get birds. Um, but as a field biologist, I, I'm a little um, biased about feeder photos. I think uh, it's, it's really good to try to capture these things in, in a natural setting. But here's a good example of, uh, of a, a bird that was at a feeder. Um, this is uh, a summer tanager. They're not a very common bird here. That's why we like to document them. And uh, although with uh, climate change, some of these birds are becoming more common, but this is a more Southern and Western species that uh, occasionally comes into Maine. So um, this bird just happened to be at a feeder. It was a very cold morning uh, for this bird. And I was able to really set up nicely and, and shoot this bird from, uh, you know, from a really close distance. Um, that doesn't always happen in the field. And this is a good example. Prothonotary warbler is another Southern species. And this is a bird that I was able to get nine pictures of at the Mount Desert Island High School before it disappeared. And I never saw it again. And somebody claims to have seen it or heard it. But uh, when you have documentation, then everybody knows that that, that bird was actually there. Um, since this photo in, in 2013, um, we've actually had a couple of other uh, records now of prothonotary warbler. And some of these birds uh, from the south do occasionally make their way up here. It's always good to document that. And then, you know, what we're curious about, is this going to be a trend? Is this something that's going to happen in the future? More of these uh, southern species. But um, at the uh, high school, this was the first prothonotary warbler that we had documented. Um, other birds uh, that have become sensationalized, I guess, is the snowy owl. Um, these are pictures from up on top of Cadillac Mountain. And um, again, uh, you have to be careful around these, these birds. Um, a lot of people wanna try to get snowy owl photos now. And um, what we're really asking people is to be very cautious how you're uh, treating these birds. Usually when I see a snowy owl, for example, I'll sit with it. And I'll just sit there until it flies away on its own. And it really doesn't matter how far away I am. But that's the beauty of uh, a 600 millimeter lens is that you don't have to be close enough to scare these birds away. And um, so uh, these, this is a good example of some of the photos that you can capture with these big um, charismatic birds uh, like the snowy owl. This actually was a male that was up at the um, airport in Hancock County. And sadly, it got electrocuted. And uh, um, we and uh, that bird actually stayed around into May. So I was actually photographing yellow warblers and snowy owls. And uh, it was a, a kind of surreal experience. But uh, that's what happens sometimes. And we this is a highly documented bird because a lot of people were up there. Um, so when you're trying to shoot these birds, you want to try to have a steady hand and really concentrate on the target because you really only have that brief moment in time. Uh, they could, um, they disappear as quickly as you see them. And so, uh, this is another shot of a bird from Cadillac Mountain. Um, so, uh, 
And then one last shot of a snowy on Sargent, one of my favorite shots, actually. It's kind of my Buddha shot. Um, this is a well-known rock, and I actually find um, pellets underneath this rock. And uh, one of my favorite pellets I found was a five-inch pellet with the full skeleton of what we believe to be a hairy woodpecker from the head all the way down to the, you know, all of the whole body. So, um, you know, if you're out trying to document things, that's another part of the documentation that you want to include in, uh, in the, your story about a particular bird. So finding that information, maybe you're going to leave it there. So you want to photograph it, but um, it, it gives us information about the, the bird. So it uh, gets us into ethics a little bit. Uh, do no harm. That's the most important thing. And I wish all photographers um, would follow that behavior. And uh, unfortunately, what we've seen is that that doesn't always happen. And that's why photographers get a bad name because they are kind of breaking those, those rules that we think of as uh, important in the uh, world of ornithology. We don't wanna scare the bird away. We don't wanna uh, cause it harm. And uh, so really keep that part in mind. That's, that's a major part of any bird photography that you're, you're gonna think about doing. Um, some of these birds' habitats are, are, are shrinking. They may only be in a very small micro habitat. So um, you wanna be careful how you're, you're behaving around the birds. You don't wanna use uh, playback, for example. Um, pishing is something I'll talk about here in a little bit, but uh, um, playback can have a, a, a somewhat of a negative um, uh, connotations for a bird, depending on what time of year it is. So you wanna be careful with that. Um, this is an example of a photo that I captured that I was able to use for our, another talk. And you can see the alewife um, being carried by the osprey. Um, this is uh, what's happening right now in our world is that these fish are coming back and our ospreys are putting on quite a show. So I occasionally see people out there trying to shoot this event. Um, so uh, good luck with that, have fun. and. Um, uh, there are some tricks that we'll talk about here to try to help make that a better experience for you. So on your camera, you got a bunch of settings and these settings are different things that you can use to um, help you with your photography. Um, for the case of birds, if you have this kind of a camera, you wanna set it to sports mode, as I said earlier. It has a fast shutter speed and it captures moving uh, uh, moments. And so that's uh, one of the um, better modes to use um, if you're just getting into this and are just starting to practice. Um, and then you get into some of the other uh, exposure modes, um, program exposure, um, you can read these for yourself. Um, the two that it, I, bounce back and forth with is manual exposure, using controls um, on your camera to control your shutter speed and your f-stop. And I actually get stuck on using aperture priority quite a bit. And uh, the, the, um, I set the f-stop and the camera selects the shutter speed that will produce the best image. And when I'm photographing birds and I'm out in the field, I don't really wanna be thinking about, well, what's the you know, what should I be doing here? I want the camera to think a little bit for me. Um, and I find that the aperture priority is one of the better ways to um, set up uh, your camera um, so that you can uh, get some of the best, better shots. Um, so other tools of the trade that we use, um, once you've taken your picture, you've got uh, Photoshop or Lighthouse, um, I've actually been using Photoshop um, and uh, probably should uh, move into some other new modern uh, light box or something, but I find I get really good um, uh, photos with uh, using Photoshop. Um, so the, the tools that we use in there are Enhance, um, sharp fi uh, Smart Fix, light, Lighting, and Sharpen. 
And uh, what you want to do is try to get to the point where you don't really have to use any of those and learn, learn how to uh, set your camera, uh, your particular camera up um, so that you have a very minimal amount of, um, uh, you know, using some of these um, tools to enhance your images. We want to try not to enhance your images at all. You want to try to present the bird as you see it um, in, in the natural setting. Um, so cropping the image is an, another important part of that. Um, you want to make sure you leave enough room for your bird so that it doesn't look like it's, uh, you know, in a little box. If it's a bird that's flying, give it a little extra space out in front. And then on the documentation, documentation side, I try to always make sure that I'm using the species, well, you have a, you have a number that you're gonna use that's your unique number for that photo. You've got a common name of the bird. You're gonna use the Latin name. And then I always use an alpha code because it's an important part that helps people to um, know what species you're talking about. And then the location is very important and the date. And then I also add your name, so MJ Good. And so for every photo that I've ever shot, this is the kind of data that I attach to it. And um, it uh, allows me to go back to a very specific place on that date and uh, you know, find that very specific bird if somebody wants to see that bird again. Um, and the beauty of this is that you can pair it up with eBird. And so you have a particular day where you have um, taken somebody out, you've shot a rare bird, and uh, you can go back to that, that, that location in eBird. And then in your data, you can go back to that same day. Um, and usually uh, I have mine set up by date so that I can go back to that very specific day. Um, uh, Knowing when birds are coming, this whole idea of frequency and distribution, um, that is uh, an important part of understanding birds. And it's just something that you start to learn over time. And um, uh, it's something that uh, is important. Um, here's where eBird data comes into play. Um, these are... Um, uh, maps that we made with Gordon Longsworth over at the COA uh, GIS lab and Ann Stunkel uh, from COA was a student at the time and she did this really wonderful work of uh, visualizing the frequency and data for a particular species. And um, so in this case, you can see um, we're looking at American crow, white-throated sparrow, um, and from two different dates. So she's able to uh, take the data from eBird and then create these really wonderful maps that show a particular species, in this case, Blackburnian warbler. So the locations where we can find those in this place uh, on the right-hand side is Northern Perula. So by using the eBird data and then having photography along with that, you can create a much richer database and uh, really gives people a under, better understanding of uh, the, um, the species uh, that, that we're trying to study. Um, here's another example um, from, her, uh, from Anna's work. This is looking at um, the, uh, the types of habitats where warblers spend their time. And this is using my data from eBird to, uh, to um, visualize some of that uh, information that, that we're collecting. So along with the, the visualization through photography, you can also visualize the data um, using the eBird data. So um, another good example was uh, we did four studies out on the Gulf of Maine to study right whales and pelagic birds. And in this case, Aaron um, was able to take the data that we had and uh, um, show that there was uh, some really nice correlation between where the birds were located and the whales out in the ocean. So, uh, um, and in that case, we're using um, photography to show the, uh, the um, creatures that we're seeing out at the sea, 
This is a flying whale. Whales do indeed fly out of the water and they land very quickly right back in it because their wings don't work very well, uh, especially for the um, right whale that, we're, that we uh, got a picture here. But it shows action. You get an idea of what's happening there, even though it's not a totally in focus photo, it does give the, uh, the viewer some idea of um, what's going on where you are. Um, some of the birds that are out on the ocean that uh, we try to capture, um, here's a northern fulmar. Um, this is one of the tube-nosed birds, the birds that have this tube nose to cover the uh, drainage that comes from the salt land that's located up above the eyes. And uh, these tube-nosed birds are birds that live all the time out on the ocean. But a lot of people don't get a chance to see these birds. So if you're out there, um, you've got to make sure you've uh, set your um, aperture and your ISO to uh, capture these birds where there's a lot of light. So you can really use uh, lower um, shutter speeds sometimes um, with all that light around. Um, but here you can see on the tip of this bird is the salt dripping off the tip of the bill. So these are kind of the little pieces of information that you can have in a photo that, uh, you know, that give people a better idea about the creature that you're, you're trying to show them. Here's a sooty shearwater, again, another ocean bird. It's very difficult to shoot from a boat and um, you've got to have yourself steady and you've got to learn ways to steady yourself. But uh, um, trying to document birds on the ocean is a challenge. And uh, I challenge all of you to go out and give it a try and uh, you know, um, practice your your photography out on the ocean. Um, a lot of people don't get a chance to see these ocean birds. So it's, it's really nice to be able to um, get out there yourself and then show other people uh, those birds. Here you can see this bird also has a little bit of a tube on it. So um, uh, the shearwaters are, are unique uh, out on the ocean. So anticipation in uh, bird photography is very similar to anticipation in volleyball. You have to move quickly. I talk about moving at warbler speed. And here's a shot of my younger self uh, diving after a ball with two of my other teammates. And, um, but uh, the same thing is going on with birds. You have to learn how to anticipate a little bit and understanding their behavior and uh, how a bird moves around will help you get better photography. And uh, that's just something you need to practice over time. Uh, a couple examples, here's a painted bunting. My first ever male painted bunting was right here in Bar Harbor, Maine. And this is a Southern species. I only got a brief moment with this bird and you can see I was shooting through an enormous amount of uh, uh, foliage and sticks and stems. So if you have your camera set on center focus, and, and uh, that's uh, where you want the camera to focus, right on the center, you want to get your little box on anything that you can that allows you to get that bird in focus, especially if you have a short amount of time to, uh, you know, to make that photo. Um, and in this case, uh, that bird stuck around for only a short time. But uh, that is a rare species here in Maine. So it was fun to document that. And um, other examples, uh, here's a, a good example of the kind of detail that you wanna try to find uh, with the bird that you're showing. Um, this gives us an idea that indeed it is a bunting. You can see the bill is bunting shaped and uh, these rainbow colors that, uh, that these uh, painted buntings have is uh, really special. So don't get overly excited, try to keep yourself calm and uh, squeeze your trigger very slowly. And uh, that will help you to um, not get so much jitter in, in your field photos. And uh, it's a whole nother thing if you're set up on a tripod, but when you're out in the field, um, tripods just kind of get in the way uh, in my world. So I try not to use tripods very much. I just kind of focus on high ISOs and um, nice uh, large aperture sizes to, or small aperture sizes to get as de uh, deep uh, 
you know, a, as large of a, a depth of field as possible. Um, another example of this uh, uh, summer tanager. These are birds that we typically see down south. To find these in Maine is, is really special. This is an immature male, of course. Um, it's red plumage is starting to come into being, but it's still yellowish, more like a female. So uh, these are really gorgeous birds to uh, see um, anywhere. But uh, here in Maine, um, it's a, a special treat. Um, so let's see. Here's uh, another bird. Um, again, owls create a problem for ornithologists uh, if you put the information out into the public. Um, I spent four hours with this bird and then all of a sudden the car started showing up. And before I knew it, there were like uh, 15 or 20 people um, in the same location trying to uh, uh, photograph the bird. So. Um, I think as a society, we have to come to terms with how we're going to deal with some of these birds and, um, you know, uh, it gets back into that whole uh, ethics of, of how we're going to do that. But here you can see we gather some information. This is a microtus um, that's being caught by the great gray owl. Um, she or he dove down and here you could see it was very quick motion. So I didn't capture that motion because I had the wrong aperture and uh, ISO setting, but it really gives you an idea of the speed that these guys are traveling to the ground. They land and put their feet through the snow and actually grab the mouse under the ground or under the snow rather. And um, next thing you know, it's got it in its mouth and whoop, it flops it into its mouth and eats the whole thing raw, uh, whole, just like that. And that's why we find pellets for these birds. Um, the pellets are the, all the material that isn't um, eaten or isn't dissolved by the, uh, by the, uh, pro, uh, the pro stomach, the uh, first stomach. And so they spit that stuff out and um, rightly so, uh, it would cause damage to them if they were trying to um, digest all that stuff. Um, it's one of my favorite creatures uh, here on MDI. We had one at Schooner Head Overlook. I gave Bill Townsend a call. I said, Bill, somebody just told me there's an owl up here, a great gray owl. I think we ought to go see it. We drove up there and sure enough, we drove into the parking lot and there he was 20 feet away from us. So uh, great gray owls don't always act like that, like that but um, it's uh, one of the opportunities that I've had in my lifetime to spend time with one of these amazing creatures. So uh, treat them nicely, don't uh, be overly aggressive and uh, let them fly away from you or fly to you. And uh, those are good um, things to think about when you're uh, out there with those uh, bigger birds. So the art of pishing. Um, pishing is a way to get the birds to come closer to you so you can photograph them. You want to um, practice pishing. It's something that I've been doing since I was a young boy and uh, kind of honed those, um, those skills over the last uh, uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, what you wanna do is um, you wanna make sure you don't pish those birds off. Um, <laughs> They, uh, pishing has a, a, a couple of effects. It can either attract the bird, it can scare it away, or it can have no effect at all. And mo mo most of the year you'll find that uh, it doesn't necessarily have an effect, but um, if you get good at it and you use um, it uh, in the correct way, you can really um, get birds to come up close to you. Um, and it's, it's just another way to attract them. As I said earlier, I don't like using uh, playback. Uh, depends on what the situation is. If it's for science, that's a whole nother issue. So um, again, just keep thinking about those ethics and how you're gonna use your photography and the skills that you're learning. Um, so uh, Canada Warbler, usually in darker situations. So you can see this picture on the left is just slightly soft, as we say. And uh, although the head is slightly in focus. So learning how to shoot under uh, light, uh, dim light conditions 
is something you'll have to practice with. But remember, you want to try to be shooting at at least f8, aperture size eight, um, and uh, it's better to go as uh, as small as you can. So those are things you practice by setting your ISO a little bit higher um, and uh, uh, bringing in a little bit more light into the, the, the camera situation. Um, photography can also be used in art. Um, here for Acadia Birding Festival back in the old days, Abby McBride uh, was one of those amazing young artists that I found um, or she found me. And uh, in 2008, when we changed the name from uh, Warblers and Wildflowers Festival to Acadia Birding Festival, Abby came into our lives and she transformed some of my photography into art. And uh, she's still doing that. And uh, I really appreciate Abby. She's now at Cornell. And um, the fact that she uh, um, did some of this art using my photography was a real uh, joy to me. And uh, I still really appreciate Abby's work um, that she did for us in the, in the beginning. Um, another Canada Warbler shot, catching some of the detail, but you can see again, a little bit soft. And um, these, th this meant that my settings were off a little bit and uh, I had made a mistake, but it, I want you to see the mistake so that you can try to figure out how to uh, uh, rectify that. Um, living here in the Northeast and in Maine, we have many alcids that show up. And some of the rarer alcids that uh, come here are the thick-billed myrrh, which is a Northern nesting species that we typically find in the wintertime. Typically, if you find one of these um, in our regional local waters, like near your own pier or uh, town pier or someplace like that, it probably means that the bird is stressed. So you wanna do your best to not put it under any more stress by getting too close. And so that's where a 600 millimeter lens is very helpful. Um, and in this case, in this thick build mirror, we wanna show that uh, the tomia, that uh, upper part of the uh, bill um, and uh, um, some of the other details uh, like this black head and not so much white on the face as you would see in a, a common bird. So uh, again, thinking about details of birds and uh, the kind of information that us ornithologists wanna know, um, it's very helpful to uh, make sure that you're getting photos that show that kind of a good deal. Um, now, in, in this case, I'm saying this is kind of poorly cropped because I haven't given this bird a whole lot of room. I would wanna spread this out a little bit more in front because the bird's going forward and maybe take a little bit away from the tail uh, and move the cropping a little bit closer to the tail. 